In a world where we often feel disconnected and overwhelmed, the quest for deeper meaning and spiritual awakening becomes ever more urgent. Today, my guest is Katherine Duncan, a leading integrative spiritual consultant, author, holistic healer, inspirational speaker, and resilience trainer. She served as a chaplain and a spiritual care provider with Fairview Home Care and Hospice, Hennepin County Medical Center, and Good Samaritan for many years. Guided by her personal experience as a childhood cancer survivor and a near-death experience, she brings a unique perspective on the interplay between emotional, physical, and spiritual health. In this episode, we are honored to speak with Catherine, whose book, Everyday Awakening, has touched many lives and has received endorsements from notable figures like Mel Robbins. With her book now in its second print run, she offers 42 exercises designed to help individuals Individuals awaken to their heart and soul. Her work is not just about healing, but about guiding others to unfold their true selves, helping us navigate life's transitions and finding joy and peace amidst challenges and also in our caregiving. With credentials spanning theology, divinity, chaplaincy, and holistic healing practices, her approach is both heartfelt and deeply informed. Join us as we explore insights as she shares from her journey and expertise. We'll discuss what it means to awaken, how we practice this in our everyday life as caregivers, and ways to connect with something greater than ourselves. Whether you are a caregiver seeking solace and strength or someone on a quest for deeper meaning and purpose, today's conversation, I promise, will encourage you. Here is my interview with Katherine Duncan. Hi, Katherine. This is so fun for me because, well, we've met in person, which was Amazing. And we're both here in Minnesota, which is so fun. And I'm so grateful that we get the chance to visit today. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, great to see you. Really fun. I'm looking forward to this time. And you know, this is a conversation I haven't had on my podcast yet. So I'm really, really looking forward to being able to visit about your story and the interplay of the mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health that we're going to be diving into. So tell us a little bit more about your journey and what brought you to focus on some of those things. I would say my journey started when I was little. I was young. I was 10 years old, turning 11 and really normal kid. But then I was suddenly really ill in the hospital, diagnosed with a very rare Childhood cancer, I was given, my parents were told I wasn't, I was too little, a 20% chance to live for two years. And my life cracked open. I just started to go through intensive treatments. And um, this was back in the 70s when they actually did have chaplains, they had counselors, therapists, but no one talked to me. And pretty quickly, I could feel like I was living on the edge, like between life and death. And that's really when my my story started then. Yeah, I can't imagine to being so young and like we feel things before, right? Sometimes we hear the words or know what's really happening. So I can't imagine the unknown you know something's going on, but not being able to probably put words to it or no one explain that to you in, in depth. Yeah, my mother, who she's still alive at 96, she's amazing, yeah. um, going strong. She, more religious, would say to me, you're going to be fine. And that was comforting as a young child. But I also, there was no sense of reality of going in every week to have chemotherapy. And back in the 70s, they did tons of amputation and it was just a really pretty rough scene. Um, so, and it's interesting, that's when, not long after starting treatment, I feeling like I was between life and death, I started to pray and prayer meant nothing to me. I mean, we would occasionally go to a Lutheran church, but I just started saying, could I please back into the universe? Could I just live? And could I live to be 20? So I used to pray, could I live to be 20? And and then not long after, this feeling of peace poured through my body, this warm feeling that took my breath away. And it was a knowing in that moment, just like oh, I wasn't alone. I was going to live. I never told anyone, but it was just, it was so comforting to me. I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, when I got your book a little bit ago and was reading it, it was actually at the perfect time because 
I felt like I was struggling with just feeling really anxious about Mm -hmm. future and a little bit of the unknown, you know, I'm in this middle time of my life. So a lot just feels like it's a little bit unsettled. So for me personally, I sat outside on my lawn chair and it was like a really pretty sunny day and the leaves were rustling and I was going through, um, you know, one of the, the meditations and kind of walking through what is in your book. So people have to read it because there's so many good things. And it just, I felt this peace. And for me, it was, yeah, it just showed up at the perfect time, which is, I think, how things happened. And there's another part of my story that I've never publicly shared. But when I was in kindergarten, I had rheumatoid arthritis in both of my knees. I was diagnosed and I had a really hard time walking. So my parents every morning would have to help me get out of bed. They'd have to take a wheelchair and, you know, walk me into the school. And we did a lot of tests and kind of figured out what was going on. But as you know, rheumatoid arthritis is, doesn't have a cure. And so my parents also would pray with me. And one night I had this like hot burning in my knees and I was so young and I didn't really know what was happening, but I woke up the next morning and I could walk comfortably for the first time and in a really long time. And I will never forget that moment. And I think, you know, reading your story and hearing more about, you know, the perspective and how these pivotal moments shape how we then show up into the world and overcoming those health challenges and finding peace through prayer. And I know prayer for all of us is so different, right? Mm -hmm. We've got many different kinds of listeners with different backgrounds that are that are tuning in, how is this time in your life and how has it shaped your perspective on that resilience and that healing since you were able to experience that? I am just, of course, grateful that I got through all the treatments. Actually, the year that I was sick, this drug came over from Turkey that was randomly being given to patients. And my father, being a businessman, he's not alive any longer, but He demanded that I got that drug. That's now standard treatment for what I had. And the survival rate was 80%. It's now 20%. It's now 80% because of this drug. So, which is amazing. So I got through the whole treatment. But then as a teenager, I started voraciously reading actually in my teenage years, why am I alive? Existentialism, who is God? What does it mean to be here on this earth? So that started me on the path Mm. of exploring life, meaning purpose. And then here I am today. I wrote a book on it. (laughs) Right. right. So I've been studying this for most of my life about What does it mean to be here, be alive, feel into the preciousness of life, to awaken into our heart and soul? I mean, I've read thousands of books and and my book has 42 exercises to help the reader. Like, how do you do it? How do you feel presence? How do you feel flow? How do you feel love? These are all things we can do and we can if we choose to. Right, right. Yes. And you had another experience that kind of changed the trajectory not kind of, it changed the trajectory of then what you decided to do for your life's work. Yes. Yep. I went through high school, college. I have five older siblings and my father, all of them were in business. So of course, yes, I went down the business path and I was in advertising and I had this amazing job with Time Magazine, regional sales position, great position, best print job here in the Twin Cities. And it was fun and it was glamorous and I was meeting all these people, but it was interesting. I worked there for uh, 10 years. The last few years, my heart was starting to feel restless. I was starting to feel like, I don't know if this is it, you know, but it's a a loose, you know, it's a, it's hard because you start to like get caught up with all the people, the money, the people, everything. And so in 2000, I was on a timing corporate trip whitewater rafting. And I had what we would call a near death experience, whitewater rafting. And I lived through it. It was a turning point in my life where I came back from the trip. Interestingly, the day I came back in a taxi with my husband, I called my mother who again, religious 
you know, she doesn't share, you know, prayers. She doesn't share dreams. She said to me, Catherine, I dreamed that I slipped into a river and I almost drowned. It was exactly the day that that happened to me. And, but it gave me the courage to give my notice within weeks. I gave my notice, even though I was on track to have an amazing year. I thought, you know what? I need to listen. I need to create space to listen, to have silence, to journal, to to where am I being called? So it really was a turning point to then step off. And then I stepped on the path of studying theology, divinity, and everything I've done to this day. You had that second chance, right? To feel fully alive. And for that whole piece of awakening, and you describe it as really this like holistic experience. So for people that are listening, that this concept is very new to them, how would you describe what does it mean to, to awake, to be awakened? I would say it's moving out of our fast chattering, busy mind, our ego mind. I think many people, it's so easy in the world today to live in your mind, live head up, to come into your body, to come into the moment, come into just the preciousness in this moment of being alive and feeling it coming into your heart, your soul. And it really culminates in this sense of deep presence of love, this interconnectedness. And I would say everyone listening right now, we've all had this experience of a moment of wonder, a moment of awe where time stops and it just almost takes your breath away. That's what I'm talking about. And we all can cultivate that and choose this. And it doesn't have to be, and I and a big message in my book, you don't have to wait till the end of your life, till you're in crisis, till you're in upheaval. Some people awaken like I did from a crisis, but a lot of people come at it because there's a searching, there's a gnawing, there's something missing, they're, they're searching for something. Or maybe they have a steeped practice, meditation, prayer practice, and a deepening happening within them. So there's many different paths, but it is that awakening into the preciousness of being alive right now. I've noticed that, you know, in the conversation around caregiving, and I find this to be true when I talk to caregivers, that they're often thrust into this role, often in crisis at times, and it is a completely different and new phase of life, and that can feel really unsettling. So it starts us on a path of, okay, is this what's happening right now? Is there something more? What do I do with that? And I think this conversation around awakening, how do we, how can we be present in these moments that we might not have planned for, right? Where it feels like that life's interrupted a little bit. And so for caregivers, especially looking at that deeper meaning, how does awakening speak to those feelings right in the midst of the weight of our responsibilities? I would say my years of being a chaplain, both at our level one trauma hospital and for Fairview Hospice and working with, yes, patients, but also many family members, caregivers. The first thing I would say is self-care. How are you caring for yourself? So important because all of a sudden you're in a caregiving role. It takes a lot of energy physically, emotionally, spiritually. So how are you finding that sense of some presence, some grounding? How are you filling up your soul to be able to care for another? So actually, the five practices in my book are, again, practices of finding that more peace, ease, breathing room within yourself. Um, And my practices, just to mention, are starting with come back to the present moment, connect with something greater, grow your trust, embody love, and hold openness. And some people gravitate to certain practices, and then you can practice different ones. But just how can you, as a caregiver, find some breathing room, some moments of silence, stillness, to really find you know that grounding and peace you need to be able to help the person you're with? It is. It is because there's so much that's happening and being able to stay in those moments and feel more grounded is is what we need to get through those days and those transition times. And I love that you reference the five practices. And the first one is coming back to the present moment. How would you very briefly guide us through a thought process or a an exercise for us that we can help achieve a little bit of that. Come back to the present moment. 
can be with your breath, with your senses. So just in the moment right now, with your breath, can we're breathing right now? Can you notice your breath coming in over your nostrils, the coolness of the air coming in as you breathe in, the warmth as you breathe out? Just noticing your breath like that, coming in, coming out. And you notice even when you breathe in how your lower abdomen naturally expands on the in-breath and then recedes on the out-breath. Just that drops you out of your mind into your body to start to calm your body. We know that five minutes of doing some breathing elicits the relaxation response, lowers your blood pressure, your heart rate, your cortisol level. We can self-regulate and self-soothe our bodies, every one of us. Yeah, we really can. There's the second practice when we talk about connecting with something greater. Mm -hmm. And what I love about your approach at it is very holistic. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you to speak to that. You know, we're not referencing a specific faith or religion necessarily. It is something greater beyond ourselves that we can hang on to. And so how how do we start to forge that connection, right? And especially when we're in times of stress or loneliness. And I know a lot of caregivers will tell me that there is a loneliness and a little bit of an isolation that takes place when we're in that role. I really like the word spirituality. It's very broad, inclusive, ecumenical of just what gives you meaning. So everyone listening, just what gives you meaning? And I've worked with so many people. It could be the word God. It could be the word great spirit. It could be energy, true nature, higher power, source, I mean, whatever that is. And it may, for some people that don't necessarily have a faith, but just a sense of energy, that vibration in our being. So I would start tuning in there, even in my book, in that chapter, I have an exercise of coming to the moment, to your breath, and then even saying the word I am, or I am presence, and just breathe and feel what's in your body just feel what what's there and start tuning in it's a great exercise yeah it is and grow your trust i love that you talk about the word trust and you say trust is the practice of moving forward despite uncertainty knowing that whatever happens we can handle it i feel like that could be a mantra <laughs> <laughs> yeah tell us more about that so the chapter of Grow Your Trust, I decided to actually define what I think trust means. I've read so many self-help books since a teenager, and there's so many books out there that say trust, trust. Well, how do you do it? How do you trust? So I think trusting is about first coming into the moment, the present moment. Can you create some space cultivating, practicing the present moment? Then can you accept the present moment? And to say accept the present moment, wow, that's easy, you know, because life can be so messy and hard. But can you just for a short time, just try to be in the moment, be here now, accepting all, not going to extremes. And when we can accept the moment and be present, then we can hear, we can listen to the guidance, every one of us, every one of us, we receive guidance and it's different for everyone. It might be visually hearing, sensing, but we all, every one of us has this gift, but you have to be quiet. You have to be still, you have to be able to listen and hear. And that's how we trust. Cause it was like, Oh, you start to sense I am on the right path. This does feel right. Trusting the guidance that every one of us receives. Yeah. And one of the conversations was around overcoming like that negativity bias. Mm -hmm. And I think trust and knowing that um, it's right to pay attention in those moments, it's also shifting from negative to positive thinking. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's still acknowledging that there's some hard challenges and things that we're going through. But how do we practically do that and get out of that um, that cycle of negativity, which I know we can live a lot of the time, right? Yeah. And it's and it's actually a conscious choice. It's a practice. I'm trained and certified in the what's called neuroplasticity training, which is fascinating. Neuroplasticity. We now know that we can rewire our brain. Our brain is plastic and we can change the structure of our brain. And 
I've worked with Rick Hansen. I'm certified in his model. I've studied many of them. And I'll tell you, every neural model that I've studied, they all have the same four steps. And I can tell you them for a minute if you want to hear. Yeah. How do you do this? Here are the four steps. The first step is... And this happens to all of us. It happens to me too, where all of a sudden you get in a worry thought, a rumination, an anxious thought. So let's hypothetically take an example. Let's say one of my sisters, an older sister said something the other day that was really upsetting. And I keep ruminating and worrying about it. So first step, can you identify that thought going on in your mind? The worry thought, the anxious thought, the fearful thought. When you can identify the thought research shows it calms your nervous system. Number two, can you identify the feeling? Not always easy. I mean, I've really, I've worked really, what am I feeling? But can you get a sense of what you're feeling? Hmm, I'm angry. I'm sad. If you can name the feeling, it also starts to calm your nervous system. Number three, can you feel the feeling for just a short time, a few minutes even? Um, I like the word curiosity. When you can hold curiosity, you're in a calm state. Can you be curious? What am I feeling? Where am I feeling it? Can I breathe into it? I promise you it will start to dissipate. The pathway to healing is feeling your feelings. So can you, even though it's like, why would I feel this, right? I could go watch TV. I could do something, but just feel the feeling a little bit. It'll start to dissipate. And then the fourth step is growing the good. And what does that look like? positive affirmation. You could say, you know, in this moment, I'm strong, I'm resilient, I'm okay. You could go to an image. So I have two dogs, a five-year-old and a seven-month-old puppy, either of them I love to death, Bella and Ollie. You know, I'll think of both of them. And it just makes me smile and warms my heart. And so when you think of that positive image, you feel that energy that is what's creating positive new neural pathways in your brain it's amazing oh my gosh and like grounded in science too i've heard something and i'm curious to to hear your perspective on it is it true that the let's say messages right out into the world that we hear that might be more negative do affect our brain but is it true that it what we tell ourselves affects us the same amount and I probably didn't say that right, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually it does. And part of, I think the whole process of growing love for yourself, I mean, we can only love another to the extent we love ourselves. We can only accept another to the extent we accept ourselves and some of the research on self-love and we've all, I'm sure done this on the call where you all of a sudden you have a negative thought, a critical thought, but there's research when you have that negative critical thought, it actually releases cortisol hormone in your body. Wow. So you know what it is? It's just start with, hmm, catch yourself. It's building, I always say with all the people I work with, my clients, building that awareness muscle, just tuning in. Why not, you know, where am I in my mind? What am I thinking? So if you can tune in and notice, gosh, I keep saying this negative thought to myself, a critical thought, catch it, name it, get it in the front of your brain, identify it, and then reframe it. And, you know, in this moment, I'm strong, I'm resilient, all is well. Those are great steps. And I feel like, too, our first reaction is we don't want to feel. <laughs> we want to just not acknowledge what we're, right? There's a lot of, like, we want to numb out sometimes or just be distracted. But how, what you're saying with the neuroplasticity is how healing it is for us to acknowledge it, name it, have that self you know, self-talk that can be, we need to be kind to ourselves. Yeah. 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 And all day long, our thoughts, what we think is then attached to the emotion and then the feeling and then the chemical release in our body, it is all connected. Mm -hmm. So just again, tuning in, where am I? You know, am I, and am I spending all day in my mind? Can I take some breaks coming into the moment? And if there's some unease, which we all experience at times, can you just, okay, I feel some unease and just breathe and let it come through you. And then there's 
this huge container to feel love and joy and peace. It's all there. It is the fourth practice of embody love. So two <laughs> quotes from your book really stood out to me. And one was from your friend, Lori, who said, when I share my love, I feel more love and I feel fully alive. The other quote was from Louise Hay, love yourself as much as you can. And all of life will mirror this love back to you. Mm -hmm. And we can be in situations where it can be hard to extend and share love with challenging people, or we're in this, you know, caregiving role. How do we extend love in those moments that really challenge us? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I think if you can, again, have the awareness if you're caregiving, whoever it is, you're a parent, a close friend, whoever that is, and you're getting triggered, can you notice, wow, I'm starting to get triggered. You know, maybe you need to take a break, take a few minutes and go to the bathroom or walk outside and just have some breathing. Or I have in my book, you know, somatic body movements of shaking off whatever unrest, letting it leave your body, whatever you need to do to bring you back into the moment that you can be present and neutral and loving. It's normal as a caregiver and I know this from companioning five family members who died in my role as a chaplain. You can get triggered. It can be difficult and challenging. But again, the more you can build your strength and resiliency and grounding, the more you're able to be there for another, to give to another. And I do think the core of that is love. And that's why I talk about embodying love. I think the reason we're here on this earth is to learn to love. And I think that's how we differentiate ourselves. And I think that's what we take with us when we die, our ability to love. And it's a practice. Yeah, it is a practice. You also share about, we say we suffer instead of accepting what is, we are trying to control it, right? Mm -hmm. So there becomes this like friction and part of that acceptance and practicing that I think is as we're aging and at the end of life, you know, as we're caring for people that we love, um, we step into that stage with them. And you obviously many, many people that you've supported in that phase of life. How do we support others in this and find the reconciliation and acceptance with ourselves, but also right? We, it's not, it's, I feel like it's two-sided in that we're navigating those emotions for ourselves along with the other person and, and the support and, and caring for them. How do we, can we prepare for this? How do we handle that emotionally? I would say one key point is going back to what's coming through you from a feeling standpoint, when we can tune in to what we're feeling, it gives us so much information of what's happening in our being physically, emotionally, spiritually. And as I say that, it really does take strength. It takes courage to be open and open into what is that unease in my being? Or what is that sadness? Or what is that angst? And being willing to tune in to try to be curious about it, to feel it. Because here's the thing, emotions aren't permanent. When we feel them, they really do move through us. And it really does help to just dive in and feel it. I'll, I'll share with you about a month ago, I was noticing some unease and I don't, I'm such a high energy and life's like, wow, so amazing. I'm like, wow, that's such a, so interesting. Why am I feeling unease? And I just spent a few days breathing into it, feeling it. And I got clear, it came through me by feeling it that, oh, you know, I am at a turning point with a big birthday coming up and my children are adults and they're really launched. And it's just, you know, some movement into another phase of my life. But by bringing it into my consciousness, by feeling the feeling, it becomes integrated. It's that neuro integration. It became integrated. And then I just felt like, oh, I felt just a whole nother level of just acceptance and peace. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And the reminder, you know, I think we forget when we're in it that the emotions will pass through because mm -hmm. right? they feel so big in the time and we want to, uh, we don't always know or have, you know, the foresight that, okay, this is going to be passing through. Um, yeah. so that's such a great reminder. 
for the listeners that are, you know, wanting to leave with not feeling as overwhelmed or anxious about the future, because so much of growing older and caring for someone is it's so unknown. We don't know timeline. We don't know what our health is going to be looking like. So there, I know for myself, I feel anxious when I don't know what's going to happen. Um, what's a message or mantra you would like to leave with us today? You know, a couple come to me. One is I would invite everyone listening, just how are you choosing to live? And I really think we can choose to bring in more peace and ease and joy into our life. And it's a choice and it's a practice. It's a conscious choice. You Again, as I was saying, you don't have to wait till some big upheaval. The other thing I would share, and this is only because I've worked very deeply in the field of aging and end of life, take it with a grain of salt, but I just have no doubt that death is not an end, that our spirit goes on. I witnessed so much. I saw so much. And I'm also a mystic and an intuitive, and I've seen a lot. So I think when the time comes, we transform. In fact, I was with so many people at end of life where a number of them would come back and see me, their spirit, within even a week or two after they died, just for a moment. In the middle of the night, I'd wake up and there they would be and they would like nod their head and be gone. And so it just, I think that deep peace and ease, can you breathe into it? Can you find it in your soul? And that is the grounding. That is the anchor. And when you live from there, it's just the unrest drops and the ease is there. The peace is there. It's within all of us. It really is. Thank you for reminding us of that. And awakening, who is it for? All of us, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, Everyone who wants to have a richer, fuller, more vibrant life. Thank you. Well, I read your book and it is right in front of me. Everyday Awakening, Five Practices for Living Fully, Feeling Deeply, and Coming Into Your Heart and Soul. Where can we connect with you? Where can we learn more, buy your book, see what you're up to? Yeah, my website, you can go to everydayawakening.com. I'm all over. I mean, I'm on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, my book, but then I'm on Instagram, Catherine Duncan, M-A-B-C-C. I'm on TikTok, the same name. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook under Learning to Live. So I'm all over my media team. <laughs> I love it. So good. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. And I've loved our visits always. I love seeing you. And we're going to have to have you on our other podcast. Sounds fun. Gather darlings. And we'll get into some other fun things. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Blessings to you and all your amazing work. Thank you. Are you looking for another encouraging podcast? Let me introduce you to my friend, Elizabeth Miller, the host of the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast. She visits with family caregivers and dives into their caregiving and self-care strategies. She also highlights that family caregivers are the experts in caregiving. Beyond the informative conversation, Elizabeth reveals the tried and true resources and practical self-care tips that empower caregivers to prioritize their health and happiness. You can find the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast wherever you download your favorite podcast or go to her website, www.happyhealthycaregiver.com. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. <laughs> In all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode. Thank you.